Welcome to LG Ministry. We're glad you have chosen to watch our program today. My name is Coogan Collins and I am the minister at the Long Grove Church of Christ. Our hope and desire is that you will open up your Bible and you'll study along with us. I personally hope that you'll always test what I say or any person says about God's Word by comparing what is being said to what the Scriptures actually say. Don't ever be lazy in this area because it's too important to simply trust in what a man is saying because we are all human and we are capable of being wrong. One thing we can know for sure is that God's Word will never lead us astray. So always trust in it. As Psalm 146 and verse 3 says, Do not put your trust in princes, nor in a son of man, in whom there is no help. Psalm 1830 says, As for God, His way is perfect. The word of the Lord is proven. He is a shield to all who trust in Him. I will always do my best to preach the truth, but I hope if you catch me teaching error that you will contact me so that we can discuss the matter. If you would like to learn more about LG Ministry and the congregation I preach at, feel free to visit our website at lgchurchofchrist.com. On our website, you will find a lot of material that can help you with your spiritual growth. On our main page, you will find an online correspondence course you can take that will walk you through the basics of the Bible. On our sermon page, you will find just about every sermon I have preached at my local congregation. You will also find some audio sermons and Bible class materials there as well that you can study and learn from and, and grow from. On our article page, you will find tracts that you can read and print off and articles that have been written for our local paper. Finally, on our video page, you will find all the new video lessons like the ones you're watching right now. I know we live in a fast-paced world where it seems like we don't have time to do much of anything, but I want to encourage you to find time out of each day to sit down and to study God's Word. Life is great and there's nothing wrong with being busy, but we must be careful that we don't become so busy that we fail to take time to feed ourselves spiritually from God's Word. We must remember that God is supposed to be our number one priority in life. Hope you find today's lesson helpful and that it will help you grow spiritually. Be sure and share what you learn in this lesson with those around you. Now let's get to our lesson. Our lesson begins with Matthew 17 and verse number 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief, for surely I say to you, if you have faith of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Jesus and three of his disciples had just made it back from the mountain where Moses and Elijah had appeared. Jesus was not back long until this man runs up to him, wanting him to cast the demon out of his son. This event is also recorded in Mark and Luke as well. When you put them all together, you find out that the nine disciples that were left behind while Jesus and the other three were on the mountain, they tried to cast out a demon out of this boy, but they could not. However, Jesus had no problem casting out this demon. No doubt the Pharisees and scribes that were there had a glimmer of hope when the nine could not do anything for this boy. I could imagine them talking about how they and their master Jesus were nothing but frauds, but Jesus crushed that thought when he cast the demon out. According to Mark's account, the boy looked like he was dead afterwards, and many even said he was dead. But Jesus took him by his hand and lifted him up, and he was cured. These nine disciples did not understand why they could not cast this demon out. And Jesus tells them it was because of their unbelief in verse 20. Did these disciples have some faith? I would like to say that they did, but it wasn't enough. And we can see how weak their faith was because Jesus tells them, For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, 
and nothing will be impossible for you. The mustard seed is a very small seed. So Jesus is telling us just how weak the disciples' faith really is. Because if they had the faith as a mustard seed, they could move mountains. In fact, nothing would be impossible for them if their faith was intact. Of course, Jesus was not talking about moving literal mountains, though God could certainly do it. But he was using this as an illustration to show the importance of having faith in God. Now the main thought of my lesson is this, is to get you to realize that the sky is the limit and that you can move mountains when you have your faith as a mustard seed. No, I'm not talking about you being able to work miracles because miracles and demon possession ended in the first century. But the principle is, is that you can accomplish great things for the Lord when you put your faith and trust in Him. We should not have the attitude that we cannot do this or that for the Lord because of a limitation. It is easy for us to believe that excuse uh, so because we're so good, uh, good at coming up with excuses to keep us from ever having to try. No one likes to fail, but you cannot know for sure if a task is out of your reach until you try. I can show you many secular examples of this, but I will share just one with you about Thomas Edison. Chances are you've heard of Edison's in relation to overcoming failure before. He was a master of trial and error. When asked about the many thousands of failures he had when trying to create the light bulb, he famously said, I have not failed. I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. But there is even more to it than that. As a child, he was thought to be dumb and told that he would never be a success by many of his teachers because his mind would often wonder in class. Good thing for us that the greatest inventor in history did not listen. I also like the ancient Chinese proverb that says, the person who says it cannot be done should not interrupt the person doing it. As Christians, we need to strive to increase our faith in God and what we are willing to do for His glory. Since our faith in the Lord is the foundation that we must build up in our own lives, it is important to understand where our faith comes from. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. A faith that will move mountains is not based on how we feel. It is not an emotional response because it is based on the Word of God. Our faith is based on the solid evidence found within Scripture, which is also backed up with secular history, archaeology, and even science. In the first century, these apostles and other followers of Jesus did not have the New Testament while Jesus was on the earth, so their faith was based on what they could see with their eyes and they could hear Jesus speak from His mouth. We have God's completed word. So our faith does not come from seeing things with our own eyes, but it comes from the word of God. So it stands to reason that if you want to increase your faith in God and have faith that can move mountains, then you must be a student of God's word. The more you study God's word and read about the faith of others, the more you increase your faith in God, which will motivate you to do things for the Lord that you thought were impossible to do. As Thomas Edison taught, even if you fail thousands of times trying to accomplish something for the Lord, don't look at them as failures. Instead, look at them as learning experiences, knowing that they did not work. But the next approach that you take may be the thing that allows you to accomplish your goal. Let's take a look at some examples from the Bible that should inspire us to increase our faith in God and realize that with Him on our side, we can achieve great things when we put our faith and trust in Him. Our first example comes from Joshua. When the children of Israel were freed from Egyptian bondage and Moses sent out men to spy on the land God had promised them, most of the spies came back with a bad report saying that there's no way that we can defeat the people of that land. However, Joshua nor Caleb had this attitude. In fact, I want to read what their response was after the people had believed the other spies' story and were talking about going back to Egypt. Numbers 14 and verse number 6, But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephnia, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us. 
a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Early on, Joshua and Caleb had the kind of faith in God that would move mountains. But unfortunately, the seed of doubt spread through the people, and they lost their faith. Notice the people's response to what Joshua and Caleb said in Numbers 14 and verse 10. And all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Now the glory of the Lord appeared in the tabernacle and meeting before all the children of Israel. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will these people reject me? And how long will they not believe me? With all the signs which I have performed among them, I will strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them. And I will make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. Now the people were ready to stone Joshua and Caleb because of their faith. This teaches us that we may encounter resistance when we have the faith to move mountains, but those around us do not. Never fear, just keep pressing forward and do not ever let others drag you down to their level of weak faith. In time, when they see your faith in action, they may be inspired to have more faith in God and may even roll up their sleeves and start helping you with the task you are working at, or perhaps they will start a new project of their own. Whatever you do, do not let anyone put your light out that you're using to glorify God. Well, I'm sure most of you know how the story goes. The children of Israel are punished for the lack of faith, and they end up having to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And so we can see from this that it also tells us that those that were 20 years or older, that they all died, even including Moses, except for Joshua and Caleb. They were the only two that would be allowed to enter the promised land because their faith in God was strong. Joshua becomes the new leader of the children of Israel. This generation that crossed over the Jordan were not like their parents because they were full of faith. And we can see that their faith in God was intact, starting with Jericho, as we read in Joshua 6 and verse number 1. Now Jericho was securely shut up because of the children of Israel. None went out and none came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have given Jericho into your hands, its kings, and the mighty men of valor. You shall march around the city, all you men of war. You shall go all around the city once. This you shall do six days. And seven priests shall bear seven trumpets of ram horns before the ark. But the seventh day you shall march around the city seven times, and the priests shall blow the trumpets. It shall come to pass when they make a long blast with the ram's horn, and when you hear the sound of the trumpet, that all the people shall shout with a great shout, then the wall of the city will fall down flat, and the people shall go up every man straight before him. This was a heavily fortified city. Even if the people inside were cut off from additional food and water, they could survive for months. Under normal circumstances, it would take a long time to defeat a city like this if you could ever get past their walls. Yet God tells Joshua, it's going to happen in seven days, and that wall that's protecting them, it's going to come down when the people shout. If anybody other than God had said this, it would be considered insane. Under normal circumstances, it would not matter how many times you marched around the walls of a city or how much noise you made. Nothing is going to happen. So Joshua and the people are going to have to have faith that will move mountains in order to believe that something like this is possible. We see their faith shine through as we continue reading in verse number 6. It says, Then Joshua, the son of Nun, called the priest and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant and let seven priests bear seven trumpets of ram horns before the ark of the Lord. And he said to the people, Proceed the march around the city and let him who is armed advance before the ark of the Lord. So it was when Joshua had spoke to the people that the seven priests bearing the seven trumpets of ram's horns before the Lord advanced and blew the trumpets, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord followed them. The armed men went before the priest who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard came up after the ark while the priest continued blowing the trumpets. Now Joshua had commanded the people, saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a word proceed out of your mouth until the day I say to you, Shout, then you shall shout. So he had the ark of the Lord circle the city 
going around at once. Then they came into the camp and lodged in the camp. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took the ark of the Lord. Then seven priests, bearing the seven trumpets of ram horns before the ark of the Lord, went on continually and blew with the trumpets. And the armed men went before them. But the rear guards came after the ark of the Lord, while the priests continued blowing the trumpets. And the second day they marched around the city and returned to the camp. So they did six days. Now think about this just for a minute. These people have heard what Joshua has told them, and they are doing it. But could you imagine being among those who are marching around the city? While my faith in God might be intact, I think I would be thinking that this is pretty strange, just marching around a city and making noise. But we don't read about anyone questioning what they were doing. Next we read in verse 15, But it came to pass on the seventh day that they rose early, about the dawning of the day, and marched around the city seven times in the same manner. On that day, only they marched around the city seven times. And the seventh time it happened, when the priest blew the trumpet, that Joshua said to the people, Shout, for the Lord has given you the city. Now the city shall be doomed by the Lord to destruction, it and all who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live, she and all who are with her in the house, because she hid the messengers that we sent. And you, by all means, abstain from the accursed thing, lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things, and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. But all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So the people shouted when the priests blew the trumpets. And it happened when the people heard the sound of the trumpet, and the people shouted with a great shout, that the wall fell down flat. Then the people went up into the city, every man straight before him, and they took the city. And they utterly destroyed all that was in the city, both man and women, young and old, ox and sheep and donkey, with the edge of the sword. They kept their faith intact, and though it seemed impossible to defeat this first city in seven days, it happened just as the Lord said it would. They shouted, and the wall came down, but they still had to run in and kill the people, which they did. If I were there and I saw that wall fall, I would have been filled with confidence that defeating these people would be easy. We can learn from this example that no matter what wall may be in our way from being successful for the Lord, if we keep our faith in the Lord and press forward, those walls will come a-tumbling down. When we see that happen in our lives, it should make us more committed than ever to do the things for the Lord that we might think are impossible. Our next example I want to look at is one that should encourage young people to increase their faith and realize that God can use the young to do great things for the Lord as well. Our example comes from David when he was a young boy. King Saul was in battle against the Philistines. But then we read in 1 Samuel 17 and verse number 1, Now the Philistines gathered their armies together to battle and were gathered together at Soko, which belongs to Judah. They encamped between Soko and Hezekiah and Ephes, Damon. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they encamped in the valley of Elah, and drew up in battle array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on a mountain on one side, and Israel stood on a mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels and a shield-bearer went before him. Then he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel and said to them, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill you, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. 
And when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the, of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. The challenge has been made. Instead of continuing the battle against each other, Goliath puts it all on the line for one battle between him and one of King Saul's men. The stakes were high because whoever lost would be the slave of the other. Goliath was a giant and King Saul apparently didn't have anyone in his army that was near the size of this mighty man. So they were afraid because their faith was weak. More fighting continues, but Goliath continues to make his challenge to King Saul. It just so happened that David was bringing supplies to his brothers when he heard the challenge made by the giant. Notice what we see in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 24. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were dreadfully afraid. So the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And it shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches, will give him his daughter and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Then David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in this manner, saying, So shall it be done for the man who kills him. Now we can already see that David has more faith in God than all the trained men under Saul. Notice what happens next in 1 Samuel 17 and verse 31. Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's hearts fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after him and struck him and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put on a bronze helmet on his head. He also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had. And his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. Here we have this young man that had never been in battle with another man. And he couldn't even use the, the normal uniform. Instead, he is ready to go face the giant with the sling and his faith in God. Now you have to give King Saul a little bit of credit here because he could have easily dismissed David because of his youth. But after he saw the faith that David had, he allowed him to enter into this crucial fight that would determine if they would be slaves of the Philistines or not. One thing that us older Christians can learn from this is that we should encourage our youth when they are wanting to try and do something for the Lord because like David, they can also accomplish great things that no one else is willing to try because of their faith in God. We know how the story of David goes. He goes out against Goliath and he tells him that he's going to die today because God is going to make it happen. Goliath thought that was pretty funny as he looked at this young man. But just as David said, he killed him. He pulled out a stone, he slung it at the giant and it hit him in the forehead. And then he went and grabbed the giant's sword, killed him with it and cut off his head. You know, we have only looked at a few examples in this lesson of men who had faith of a mustard seed that were able to move mountains. Examples like these in the Old Testament and the New Testament should inspire us to increase our faith in God and make us realize that we can do all things through Him. It does not matter if you're old or young. You can accomplish what seems impossible 
for the Lord when you have your faith intact. As Paul said in Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I hope this lesson will inspire you to know with great confidence that you can have a faith that can move mountains.